Okay, welcome back to Ancient Medieval Humanities. Today we are going to be moving on with our investigation of the Archaic Greek period. We've covered the historical overview. The last session we took a look at ancient Greek religion, including the mystery cults. And today we're going to be moving on to the early philosophers. This is the birth of philosophy as far as Western civilization is concerned. And we're going to be starting with a group that are known as the pre-Socratic philosophers, which tells you how they relate chronologically to one of the most famous philosophers of the ancient world, somebody that I'm sure you all know. Don't need to point out the name. So let's dig into the introduction. And before we get to the actual philosophers, I'm going to be looking at four different individuals out of a group of dozens of potential um, candidates to investigate. But before we get to the specific philosophers that I want to look at, I want to talk a little bit about some of the big questions that the philosophers of this era are going to try to wrestle with, some of the big concerns that they have. Because sometimes I think it's easier to understand a philosopher when you understand what it is they're trying to respond to or what it is they're trying to address. So this is, like I said, pre-Socratic philosophy. Now the philosophers in this pre-Socratic period are essentially the scientists of the ancient Greek world as well. In this early stage of development, you don't have a distinction between science and philosophy. They were all one and the same for the most part. So the guys that we're looking at can be referred to as natural philosophers. They were interested in nature, right? So there's a certain quest that they're going to go on, and there's certain questions that they're going to be asking themselves. This is early metaphysics, we could say. Uh, if you have never studied philosophy before or have not uh, been introduced to some of the branches of philosophy, there are a number of major branches like logic and epistemology, uh, ethics, and then metaphysics. I'd say those are the four big branches of philosophy. Metaphysics seems to be one of the most... Um, sounds at least one of the one of the trickiest. It almost sounds like you're doing some kind of magic. Uh, but metaphysics is really just a study of being or the nature of reality. Uh, the term actually comes from the way um, Aristotle's writings were compiled by his students. And uh, it just means that the which follows the physics and the arrangement. Uh, metaphysics is... I think a very interesting branch of philosophy, but it's very abstract, right? When we talk about the nature of reality or the science of being, what exactly does that mean? Um, you know, to be, it's a, it's a pretty broad term, but we're going to be addressing that as we get into uh, some of the big questions. You can also call it ontology, right? Ontology is a study of being as well. Now, the questions that are at the forefront right now in this early, early period are going to be things like the question of the one and the many, which is basically the idea of unity and diversity, trying to explain why reality is both united yet filled with diverse particular things that we encounter in our experience. So we could think about, for instance, humanity. When we look at the world, we see all kinds of individual particular human beings, no Two human beings are exactly the same. Even twins aren't exactly the same. There's differences between every individual particular. Yet at the same time, we come away with a singular idea of humanity. Right? How is that possible? These are the types of things the Greeks are wrestling with. Now, you also have to remember that prior to the arrival of the natural philosophers, the pre-Socratic philosophers, you're trying to answer a lot of these same questions through mythology. And I don't want to make it sound like mythology is completely divorced from philosophy, but it definitely approaches these questions in a different way, right? Through narrative, through um, the speculation as to divine beings. Mythology is more related to what we talked about last time with religion, okay? This shift, as we'll see very soon with our first pre-Socratic philosopher, is going to be radical, okay? It's going to, it's going to make a huge um, leap from one world to another. So that's the first question. The second question is the question of the cosmos and the chaos. What is cosmos? Well, we don't necessarily mean astronomy here. We mean the ordered universe. And chaos would be the disordered, indifferentiated conditions that could obtain or could be here. And uh, maybe even the types of things, again, going back to mythology, the Greek myths that talk about the creation of the world. As a matter of fact, 
creation myths from all over the world usually are stories about moving from some sort of chaos to some kind of cosmos, moving from disorder to order. That is the creative motif, okay? Um, the Greek myths themselves, the myth by Hesiod, the Theogony, actually starts with chaos. It's a Greek word, okay? It actually means a gap. But the question for the philosophers is why isn't everything random, chaotic? Why are we in an ordered cosmos? How do we account for that interesting phenomenon? The third question, which is really the quest, is a search for the RK. Okay, RK would be the one chief substance from which all other things emerge. It's the, the one thing. It's the stuff of reality. Okay, you're going to need to find something out there, at least they believed, that is going to explain everything else. And it needs to explain three things most fundamentally. It needs to explain being itself, why things exist. Okay, so we're going to be playing a little bit with the verb to be with some of these early philosophers. Maybe a little bit um, tricky, but again, bear with me. Hopefully it'll make sense. It has to explain life. You know, why are certain things alive rather than, you know, non-living? And it has to explain the phenomenon of motion. You know, why do things move? So they're going to be looking for something that apparently has the power of motion within it. All right, so... Off we go on our quest. We're going to start with the father of philosophy, a guy by the name of Thales. Now, to point out the uniqueness of Greek philosophy, you just have to realize that you have already investigated the ancient Near East. We've looked at Babylon. We've looked at Sumeria. We've looked at Egypt. Um, there was a strong tradition of astronomy and mathematics in places like Babylon and Egypt, but they never gave rise to full-fledged philosophy the way we're going to see with the ancient Greeks. Okay? Um, so... The, the shift in uh, way of approaching reality is really the key here. And I'm going to show you kind of how this is done when we look at Thales and some of the things that he does. First, a little bit of a background. We don't know a whole lot about the guy, but we do know that he is from the place known as Miletus, which we've seen before. We talked about the Ionian Revolution, the Ionian Revolt against Persia. It started at the city of Miletus. This is an old city. goes all the way back into the Bronze Age. And there's a school of philosophy set up at Miletus known as the Milesian School, which traces itself back to Thales. So he had a number of students, some of which are important and it would be nice to be able to have time to talk about some of these guys, like Anaximander and Anaximenes and stuff like that. But we're just going to focus on Thales individually, and he would probably live somewhere in the early 6th century. Okay, And we can guess this based on the date for the birth of philosophy, which I'll get to in a second. But before I get to that, he was not just a philosopher. He was an engineer, a mathematician, an inventor. He was a thinker. right? He was a Renaissance man long before the Renaissance. And this, again goes back to that idea that I was saying before, that there's really no distinction between science and philosophy. This is an approach to reality where you're using reason and observation, and you're working out problems, okay? So one of the things, for instance, that he was able to do is measure the height of the Great Pyramid using its shadow, okay? He has a, an interesting way of approaching problems and analyzing and being able to come up with a solution to things. Another thing that he does, and this is where we get the birth date for philosophy, uh, which happens to be on May 28th, 585 BC, he predicted a solar eclipse ahead of time. Now, a good astronomer might be able to do this, but the significance of this particular event is if you think about the world from the mythological or religious point of view that we've already been talking about, where you have nature actually run by the gods, right, by personalities, when the rivers overflow, it's because the gods are angry or whatever. When personalities are moving nature, when personalities are determining the behavior of nature, they're not going to be predictable things. They're not the types of things you could predict ahead of time that have any kind of regularity to them. Right? So the significance here is he's noticing there is regularity to the universe. He's recognizing we can work these things out in advance. And therefore, we are not dependent on some kind of mythological perspective. Okay, now it's not that the Greeks immediately abandon the idea that the gods have something to do with reality, but he's trying to explain things without appealing to religion, without appealing to myth. 
And that's the significance of this moment, which is why we could actually say this is the birth of philosophy. Okay? So even though we don't tend to think of a solar eclipse as a philosophical issue. Okay. Now, oops, moving further, got my cursor. Okay. The RK. For Thales, when he tries to come up with the primordial substance, he posits water as the RK. Now, going back to myth, which I've just said we've departed from, you could very often in these creation myths from around the world find at the very beginning of things, not only chaotic state, but usually represented by some kind of watery body. Okay, In Egypt, you've got the Nun, you've got the waters of chaos. You've got that same thing in various stories, the Enuma Elish and, uh, and whatnot. So is he just positing water as the primordial stuff of reality merely because this is what's been talked about in these myths from all times? Uh, probably not. I think he was probably using some reasoning to come to a solution because our, if you remember, there are three things the Arche needs to be able to answer. He needs to answer being, life, and motion. And if you think about it, Arche, or sorry, water, is a thing that we can find in three basic forms. So I can imagine Thales thinking, okay, everything that I see that exists that um, has being comes in one of three basic forms, solid, liquid, or gas. So what type of substance have I seen that can take those three forms? And of course, water is the first thing that probably comes to mind because we've all seen it in the form of ice, we've all seen it in the liquid form, and then we've seen it evaporate as we boil a pot of water or something along those lines, water vapor. Okay, so he says, okay, water. Water seems to have those, those, those characteristics. Okay, so check box one. Then he says we need to find something that's going to account for the existence of life. And again, water is the first thing that should come to mind because whether you're plant, animal, human, everything requires water to survive. And everything is composed primarily of water. So water is obviously intimately connected with the idea of life. You can't have life without water. The next thing that we have is the possibility of motion. And this may sound weird because why would you think water has anything to do with motion. But if, again, you think about it for a second and look out at rivers and seas, again, the Greek whole, the whole Greek world is really centered around the sea. It's obvious that the, the, the sea is constantly moving. Rivers are constantly flowing. There seems to be something about the water, right? They don't know about the, uh, uh, the gravitational pull of the moon on the uh, oceans and seas and stuff like that. But it would appear that water has this power in and of itself to move, right? It would be what the Greeks would call hylozoistic, okay? So here's his answer. It's water. It's obvious. Now, it's a good solution. It's a rational solution. It's not the correct solution. And even his own students departed from water pretty quickly and posited other elements like air and, um, and whatnot. But you can see how we're moving in a, in a, in a new direction. So Thales is going to be very important, and we can define him in a certain way. We're going to put him in a class of philosopher that we're going to call materialist. He was what we can call a corporeal monist, in that he's trying to explain all of reality based on some one monist, one physical body, or one physical stuff or substance. Okay, so corporeal, the word for body. Okay, one bodily substance, and materialism would be another way that we could describe that. Everything is matter. Okay, materialism has been with us from the very beginning of philosophy and is still with us today among philosophy and science. All right, so that's Thales, kind of in a nutshell. So let's take a look now at somebody that I'm pretty sure you're uh, more familiar with, or at least you've come across the name, Pythagoras. All right, now we're still talking philosophy. We're not talking... Um, mathematics, but we can't really divorce the two because the school that Pythagoras founds has a huge emphasis on math, but primarily it wasn't a mathematical school. What it is, is a religious cult. Okay, so let me... So Pythagoras, the, the one thing that most people know immediately is the idea of the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, we don't need to say what that is. It's, it's, it's pretty familiar if you've taken any kind of class in geometry, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, which I said I wasn't going to say, but I did it anyways. So 
Uh, we don't even know for sure if Pythagoras is the guy that came up with the Pythagorean theorem, but it definitely came from his school, which, like I said, emphasizes mathematics. But let's go through a little bit of a background. We don't know a lot about Pythagoras either. These are still very early figures. He does not come from the Greek mainland. I probably didn't point out that out when I talked about Thales, but neither Thales nor any of the individuals that we're talking about today came from the mainland of Greece. They all came from either Asia or Italy for the most part. So he's from the island of Samos, and then he moved to Croton in southern Italy, one of the Greek colonies there, which is where he had set up his school. The school is known as the Pythagorean school. There are various versions of this because the school lasts for centuries. There are Neo-Pythagoreans and stuff like that down the road. And it was interesting because it was open not only to men but to women, uh, which is something I think we saw with some of the mystery cults. But um, philosophy we tend to think of as kind of a male-dominated sport, uh, which it wasn't, obviously. And this is a great example of one that was open to everybody. It was, however, a very rigorous community. Like I said, as a religious school, not just a philosophical school, it had an entire lifestyle that went with it. It was a structured life, religious teachings, you had common meals, you had exercise, meditation, um, a lot of study, and again, most of that philosophical study is going to revolve around mathematics in some fashion. His dates generally put between 582 and 496. Again, we don't know with any accuracy whether that's correct but that's the general time period that we're talking and as opposed to just being a mathematician and a philosopher he is easily a cult leader like i said if this is a religious movement cult remember is not a negative term but he is a kind of a personality that acquires a group of followers now what were the teachings of the religious aspect of pythagoreanism uh, first of all, he taught through the use of what are called symbola, which are these short, pithy sayings, these kind of one-liners that he would utter, and his students would then memorize these, and they'd give you guidance. And it advocated a very strict asceticism. If you remember our last lecture when we talked about the Orphic cult, it's going to have a lot of parallels with Pythagoreanism. As a matter of fact, there's probably some influence between the two groups. The strict asceticism, again, is the idea of shunning the physical, and concentrating on the spiritual or the mental. And they believed in the same type of anthropological dualism, though I don't think I used the term anthropological dualism. I did talk about the soma and the tsuke with the orphix, the idea of a body and a soul. That's what we mean by anthropological dualism. I'm not talking social science. I'm talking study of man from a philosophical or even a religious point of view. And dualism just refers to the idea that there are two aspects to the anthropos, or to the, to the human being, body and soul. And that soul, just like for the Orphix, goes through a transmigration, a reincarnation process from life to life. And living the right lifestyle was about purification, purifying the soul so that it eventually will escape the reincarnation process. And if I didn't point out earlier when I did the Orphic material that, you know, Orphism, Pythagoreanism, you know, a lot of the Greek... Uh, thinkers that believed in this idea of a transmigration of the soul, very similar to what you may have already encountered when you studied, hopefully you have studied, something like um, Hinduism or Buddhism. These ideas were very prevalent in the East and still are today. Okay. Uh, anyways, there are a couple sects that evolve out of the original Pythagorean core. The group known as the Mathematikoi was a society that obviously focused on math. I love the name. Uh, not that I'm a huge fan of math, that's why I went into humanities, but it focused on mathematical development, advances in math, and continued to push forward with mathematical knowledge, whereas another group of followers of Pythagoreanism, known as the Ecusmaticoi, uh, still practice math and use math, but they were more focused on the moral behavior and the ritual purity and those types of things and didn't really advance the research the way ma the Mathematicoi did. Okay, but they're both traditionally Pythagorean in their approach to um, the general philosophical worldview. So let's talk about math and religion and see some of the things that he came up with. Some of these things you probably actually heard of. So uh, calculus, not necessarily a term, not that he developed calculus the way we think of it today. Uh, he didn't, but the word comes from the Greek. And this comes from the use of pebbles in counting. The, uh, a calculus was literally a little a stone, okay? So um, I think when I gave you the early periods uh, in the very beginning of the semester, I talked about the calcolithic um, period. Uh, it's kind of a word 
uh, this relates to copper. Um, I think it's the same root word. I should stop before I bungle the, the, the roots here, but um, it would be a little pebble. Anyways, the pebble could be used for counting. You could think about teaching ch uh, child mathematics, right? Uh, you could take uh, a number of pebbles, like five pebbles, and then subtract three pebbles, and you have two pebbles, a very visual way to teach, ma teach mathematics to somebody. But the interesting thing about math, of course, is that you don't need to use physical objects to do it. Right? It's a mental activity, and numbers are abstract things. They're not things you can physically touch. You can touch pebbles. You can't touch actual numbers. Okay? Now, what you may have heard of are things like square numbers. Okay? If you, I think everybody's heard of square, square numbers, right? Um, so you might not know where the word comes from or why they're called square numbers, but it has to do with geometrical patterns that you could arrange say these little pebbles into. So for instance, the square numbers as I show you on the screen, number four, number nine, number 16, number 25. Why are those the square numbers? Well, again, if you are trying to make a perfect square using objects like little pebbles, you know, you have to have a certain number to actually make a perfect square. You know, four pebbles you could arrange into a perfectly square figure. To make another larger square, by adding pebbles, you have to add five more pebbles. Now you have nine, right? Three by three, um, and so on. So that's where the idea of a square number comes from. Okay, it's a Pythagorean development, but there are all kinds of numbers besides square numbers. You know, they played around with geometry and different arrangements and patterns, which is a real big focus of the Pythagorean, looking at the world and how it's ordered, how it's formed and structured, and notices, you know, balance, harmony, pattern that's kind of inherent in the cosmos. Uh, they also had you know, triangular numbers. Um, as a matter of fact, we're going to talk about the number 10 in a, a very, very shortly. Um, you know, a triangle is a perfect shape. It's a very stable shape, and the number 10 is going to become one of the most important numbers from the Pythagorean point of view. It's called the uh, tetractus is what it's called. They also had pentagonal numbers, oblong numbers, numbers that you probably have never heard of, I mean, not the number themselves, but those names you've never heard of because you don't usually study pentagonal numbers in school anymore, where we do still talk about square numbers. Okay, anyways. Now, mystical significance was tied to numbers. So they practice what we can call numerology. Um, now, like I said, numbers are abstract. They're things that your mind can grasp that you can't physically touch. So it's... An intellectual pursuit doing math. It's a spiritual pursuit. And it's the idea that you're focusing on something that is beyond the physical, right? With this whole idea and the religious aspect of the cult of shunning the physical, living the ascetic lifestyle, and, and elevating the soul, the whole idea of mathematics becomes a spiritual discipline, right? It's a matter of the soul. And by focusing on math, doing math, and thinking mathematically, in a way, prepares the separation of the soul from the body because it, again, focuses on the senses and the mental life. And that separation is actually, they would believe, beginning while we're still alive. Before we even die, the soul is already being separated or prepared for its ultimate separation from the body, which is kind of an interesting way to think about math. Nobody tends to think about religion and math as being intertwined anymore. When you go to a math class in school, you don't have people complaining about separation of church and state, right? Uh, same thing if you you know go to church or the mosque or synagogue. You're not going, and you you're probably not going to be working out, um, you know, doing your long division while you're there. Okay, for the Pythagoreans, very different. So, what, what's this numerology? The significance. I'll give you a few numbers that had you know some significance to them. I'm not going to give you a whole bunch, but you know a few basic ones. The number one, which was called the monad, that symbolizes unity. It's the number of reason. And it can be represented visually by a point. Okay, the number two, the dyad, would be the number associated with femininity or womanhood, and that would be represented by a line. Okay, basically two points being connected. Number three was the number of man, the triad. This was masculinity. It would represent, be represented by a plane, not an airplane, but the type of plane we think of as a flat surface, okay, where you have three points connected. You now have a surface or a plane. Number four would be the central number, and really interestingly, it's, it's a very foundational number. You don't think of it as a central number, but it, it was, and I'll show you why in a second. It was the number of justice. 
okay? It was the number that represents solid, and I'll talk more about that in a second as well. Then you've got number five, which would be marriage, basically taking two and three, adding them together, man and woman, marriage. Six would be man, woman, and child. That would be the number six, this a symbol of creation. And then just jumping up to 10, because like I said, 10, the tetractus is the perfect number. We still think of it today as you know rating something on a scale of one to 10, 10 being perfect, okay, is the sum of the first four. So again, going down to that triangle that I show you, the number 10, you know, a perfect shape, three-sided, but the base of the triangle is stable on four, okay? You start with four and then add three above it, two above it, one at the top. It's the first four numbers added together give you 10. So 10 kind of encapsulates the first four numbers and becomes really significant. This is where we get that whole idea from, okay? The whole decimal system, right, based on the number 10. So it's a, it's a perfect and useful system. So we could thank Pythagoras for that. Uh, again, with mathematics, you would imagine they would also branch off into other areas of study like music, medicine, astronomy, beauty. Okay, For instance, music, everything is about ratios. If you take a chord, put it under tension, and pluck it like a harp string or a lyre string, it'll make a note. If you cut that chord in half and put it under tension, it's going to make a note that's mathematically um, related to the original. You know, it's all based on the length of the chord under tension, you know, equal tension. But um, everything is, is ratios. I mean, the entire scale of, of notes, and I don't know that much about music, is something you can calculate mathematically. Medicine for them would be a balance and harmony in the body. Astronomy, you know, the, the motion of the, the spheres in the, in the sky would be predictable. There would be things you could observe that move orderly through the, the sky every night. Beauty itself was a matter of proportion. You know, what is it to be a beautiful person? Well, for them, your eyes and nose and mouth would be situated in just a particular way. You should have kind of the same harmony from the left side to the right side of the face. Um, the Greeks picked this up in their architecture, right? Greek architecture very much is about balance, harmony. They tended to think of things as needing to be kind of symmetrical. So all that kind of stuff for Pythagoras is mathematical. Now, how does this relate to the arche? Well, when he wants to address the nature of reality, what is the stuff from which everything is made? He says it is made of numbers. Okay? Now, I should maybe get to that a little bit prematurely because it doesn't show up in the slide just yet, but... Um, Again, underlying the physical world, we want to find a substance that's going to account for everything that exists. And he's not going to posit, obviously, a physical thing if he's going to say that the RK are numbers or is number. Um, but why is he able to posit something non-physical to account for everything that's physical? Well, again, when we talk about math, you know, we can reason abstractly about points, lines, planes, without having to think about physical bodies, right? It's helpful to visualize drawings or, 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 you know, physical bodies, but you don't need to have physical bodies to talk about math. But you can't understand physical bodies without the underlying concepts that are mathematical, like lines and planes and such, okay? So, for instance, going back to the idea of the point, the line, the plane, you know, and the first four numbers, you know, what is a point mathematically? It's something that doesn't have length, width, or depth. There's no dimensions to it whatsoever. Mathematically speaking, a line has length. When you have three dots connected, now you've got a plane. It has length and height, but no depth. It's flat. It's two-dimensional. As soon as you add that fourth point, that's why four is such a fundamental number. As soon as you add that fourth point, now you've got the third dimension, length, width, depth. Okay, and that's what the physical world is. Everything that we encounter is part of a three-dimensional universe. Okay, so fundamentally the world is composed mathematically of these, these numbers. So again, the RK is number. It's the base of reality. It has its own reality and its properties are things we can discover without the use of the senses. We can discover them by reflecting and thinking alone. Okay, it's formal. Form right now is a term that we're going to be dealing with as we follow philosophy forward. It becomes really important with Plato and Aristotle, so I'm introducing the form concept right now. It's kind of a relationship um, that explains order, a reality. When we talk about something being formal, 
We're, we're saying it pertains to the essence of something, the nature of something, to give it its identity as, as what it is, as opposed to the material aspect of a thing. Okay, so we're going to distinguish form and matter. Thales, we were talking about matter. Pythagoras, now we're talking about form. Those two concepts are going to be, you know, dealt with in conjunction by both Plato, Aristotle, and others after them. Okay, but we'll call him an idealist. He's not a materialist because he doesn't believe there's a material basis behind all reality. There's an immaterial principle at the root of all things. All right, so now we've got a materialist, we've got an idealist. Some people look at the whole history of philosophy as kind of a struggle between these different perspectives, materialism, idealism, and variations on them. So very much from the beginning of philosophy, this has started. The next guy, and there's two more to go, uh, and they're the two more difficult ones. Uh, I don't think Heraclitus is necessarily going to give you much uh, puzzlement uh, because I think he takes a very understandable and reasonable approach to reality. He is, like many modern people, an empiricist. He is going to rely on his observations, the information that he gets through his senses, and he is going to, in a way, reject both materialism and idealism as he produces his, his view of reality. Now, again, he's not from the mainland. He's back in Asia, Ionia, a uh, city known as Ephesus. His date's approximately 545 to 485 BC. He's also known as the dark philosopher because he wrote in a very obscure way. And we don't have a lot of his writings. That's one of the problems with all of these early thinkers. We don't have much of what they wrote that remains. So just kind of piecing their thinking um, together from the fragments that we do have sometimes uh, leads to confusion. And uh, it's very possible that we misrepresent what they actually taught. Um, but again, we can't really help that. He's sometimes called the father, father of modern existentialism because he attacks the idea of an essence or a form or any kind of stability within a thing, uh, and rejects, like I said, materialism and idealism. Here's how he approaches the world. He says the arche is fire. Now, did he mean this literally? Right? We've talked about the arche being water. You know, We've got different elements we think of, you know, like fire, air, earth, water, those types of things. Is he just picking up another element and saying, okay, it's not water or air, it's fire? Or is he using this in kind of a symbolic way? It's hard to really know. But the interesting thing about fire that kind of captures his view of reality is that fire is something you can feel, but you can't really hold on to it, right? You can pass your hand through it without grasping it. So it's not material in the way water is. Um, it affects you, and it's constantly moving, right? If you look at a flame, it doesn't stop shifting and changing and morphing and consuming whatever it's burning. Okay, it needs a fuel. And that's kind of how he views reality. He's going to give us a category that we're going to call becoming. His famous quote is, no man can step into the same river twice. Now, what does he mean? Well, he's referring to this idea of flux. All things for Heraclitus are in a state of flux. Pantarei is the Greek for flux. So, or for all things are in flux. So everything is becoming, or rather we could say it's coming to be. It's constantly changing and moving, and it's never the same any two minutes. So if you you know, put your foot into the river and then step out again and put your foot back into the river, it's not the same river because the water has moved on. Uh, and even if the water hasn't moved on, uh, it, you've changed. There's something that changes from moment to moment, even if it's completely imperceptible and very subtle. So it's a constant phenomenon. The only thing, and I already used the word constant, the only thing that doesn't change is itself the fact of change, right? And truth is found in that constant, that constant idea of change. And that involves also dialectic. It involves um, kind of a, a play between opposites, which leads to growth and development. There's a unity in this tension. I go back to that idea that I used to illustrate music with the, the lyre string, the chord. You can't just take a chord and expect it to make music. You've got to put that chord under tension. There's got to be a pulling in opposite directions before it will make music. So that's kind of the idea that he sees. There's a struggle of opposites. There's a pulling uh, and a fighting that goes on in nature, in reality. And it's what gives reality its, its 
observable, definable form, okay? Anyways, and I, I shouldn't have used the word form because he kind of rejects that idea, but anyways, the conflict isn't random. That's the other thing that's interesting about Heraclitus. He observes that there is a pattern to the world, right? And he tries to explain the regularities in the midst of the conflict through a concept that he's going to use called the, the, the logos, which is the root word for where we get um, the word logic, right? It's kind of almost like there's a logic to reality. Uh, basically, be translated as word, reason, account, or something along those lines. There's various translations for it, but it's going to be a really, really important concept as we look at later philosophers and even into early Christianity, who draws on that term as well. So the logos accounts for the regularity in the universe. Uh, it's not necessarily a god. It's kind of an abstract principle. So um, whatever you want to conceive of it as, it at least allows for regularity, which is why human beings give birth to other human beings. They don't give birth to elephants. Right? It's why an acorn will grow into an oak tree and not into a rabbit, Okay, because it's not pure randomness. Things may be changing, but they change in an orderly and predictable way. Okay, so logos we can think of as a universal reason or a discourse, kind of a back and forth. Uh, it's impersonal, it's also eternal, and it supplies a principle that we call the principle of telos. Telos just means kind of a goal or a purpose or an end, okay? And that is what guides this eternal flux, all right? He's an empiricist. Like I said earlier, he has a philosophy that we can identify with because we tend to be empirical in our own approach to reality, meaning we trust our senses. You know, it's obvious that things are changing. You just look around you and you see that that's true. Or do you? That's where we introduce the next and last thinker for today. It's Parmenides. Parmenides disagrees fundamentally with pretty much everything Heraclitus says. And this is where it's going to get confusing. So try to stick with me the best that you can. Parmenides uh, another big brain individual from the pre-Socratic period. He is living and teaching in Italy at the town of Alea. So his school is going to be known as the Eleatic School, a very important school there. His dates, you could say he's roughly contemporary with Heraclitus. Some people say he was earlier. Some people say he was later. Uh, I think most tend to think of him as writing in response to Heraclitus. So we'll put him just slightly younger than Heraclitus. And he did leave us a work that's called On Nature. As a matter of fact, that's an, an, a title that's interesting only because there are so many ancient philosophers that wrote works that are titled On Nature. That seems to be like the most popular title. I guess they knew it would sell if they titled it On Nature. And it's based on, it's made up of two portions. One's called The Way of Truth, Aletheia, and the other's called The Way of Opinion, or Doxa. Okay, now he's going to distinguish between truth and opinion. And he's really going to relegate everything Heraclitus says to the realm of opinion. It's the realm where we are working off of our sense experience. And opinion, doxa, is going to lead us to ultimately error. The truth is something that we can't grasp that way. We don't get truth by relying on our senses. Okay. And by the way, this is another big issue in philosophy, those that rely on the senses, the empiricists, and those that rely on the reason, which we call the rationalists, okay? That entire struggle, again, begins in the ancient world and has continued through the whole history of philosophy. Um, we're going to call Parmenides a rationalist, where Heraclitus was an empiricist. Now, his concept that we're going to focus on now is the word being, as opposed to becoming, so remember, Heraclitus talks about everything becoming, everything changing. Parmenides says, Parmenides says, no, no, things aren't changing. Things are not becoming. Whatever is, is. Profound statement, even though it sounds really simple. How can that be profound? I mean, you know, it is what it is. We, we still say this essentially today. Well, he means something very important in this short, short phrase. And we can reason out what he means by looking at it from this point of view. If anything exists, it must exist in an absolute way, he believes. It can't change. Why? Because something can't be and not be at the same time and in the same way. That's a fundamental law of reason. We call this the law of non-contradiction. Okay? It can't be and not be at the same time and in the same way. If something is becoming, then it's not being. Because becoming, like we said earlier, means coming to be. And if it's coming to be, then it not, uh, is not yet being, right? So if it's becoming, it's not being. That makes sense. 
And if it's not being, there would have to be nothing. So it has to either be absolutely or not exist at all entirely. There can't be any in between. This whole idea of becoming doesn't make any sense for Parmenides. And he's saying just reason it out carefully on your own. And you're going to see that this is true. Now, what does this mean? Well, again, i give you a Latin phrase here, even though he was a Greek philosopher. Ex nihilo nihil fit is the idea that out of nothing, nothing comes. This was his big thing. You can't get something from nothing. And it's actually a fundamental principle in science. You can't get something from nothing. Now, whatever is, this being, this existence, which he asserts is, is one, it's eternal, and like I said, it cannot change. So he's positing a universe that is singular, has always been there, and is not changing in spite of what appears to be the case. That's why truth and opinion have to be distinguished. Okay, so let's press this a little bit further. Ultimately, what he's saying is you can't rely on your observations. You can't rely on your senses. Change, as you see it, is an illusion. Nothing is really changing. Matter of fact, you can even go further and say, well, there are not even multiple things. Like we just said, being is one, which means we think we're looking at a world of diverse particular objects. You know, you've got a person over there, you've got a tree over there, you've got a chair in the corner. But he says, no, that's part of the illusion as well. There aren't many things. There's only one thing. Interesting way to approach that question of the one and the many. There's not unity and diversity. There's just unity. Um, and one way he can argue for this, and I think I just lost the camera again. One way he's going to argue for this is by saying for there to be two things, the two things would have to differ. Now, you can only differ in a couple of different ways. You could differ according to your being or your non-being. But to differ according to being wouldn't be to differ at all because being is the thing that you all have in common. And you can't differ according to non-being because non-being is nothing, which means there's absolutely no way you could have being even in theory. Now, I usually ask my students in the classroom to you know, picture for a moment change and tell me what they're picturing. The interesting thing about doing a mental activity like that to try to picture change is that you really can't picture change unless you first picture a thing that changes, right? Change is meaningless without some kind of object lying behind the change, right? You might be picturing like the flowing of a river. You might be picturing a child growing up into an adult. You might be picturing the wind blowing. But whatever you're picturing, there's an it first. There's something that bees or is before you can think of it changing, Okay, And that's kind of what he's getting at. That fundamentally, things can't be just becoming. They have to be being. Now, I think I just lost the feed again. Okay, so we'll define Parmenides as a rationalist. Now, to defend Parmenides, we're going to take a look at his most famous student. I, say, I said we're only going to cover four thinkers, but I'm going to introduce this fifth one just briefly. This guy's known as Zeno, um, the Eleatic. There's a couple of Zenos that are pretty famous from the ancient world. I think we'll look at another one down the road in the Hellenistic period. But for now, we'll talk about Zeno, who produced what are called the paradoxes. And the paradoxes you may have heard of, they're one of the more famous groups of little stories or puzzles that have been presented. And the whole idea of these puzzles is to kind of defend Parmenides and show why he's correct, uh, show that his metaphysics is true. And he's going to use a technique in philosophy that we call reductio ad absurdum. And it's a Latin phrase, but I think you can figure out what it means pretty clearly. It means to reduce to absurdity. And the idea, this is the way it works, it's actually very effective. It works by positing a, um, an idea or assuming, making an assumption, and then working from that assumption to follow out where the logic leads. And if it leads you to some kind of ultimate contradiction, an absurdity, then you could toss out the assumption. Or maybe there was a problem in your argument, but there's basically a problem somewhere. If it leads you to a contradiction, there, then there's an issue. So that's the way he's going to proceed. So let's start by talking about an argument against this idea of plurality. Why can't there be multiple things in reality? Why is reality or being one? Try to follow this the best you can. I hopefully will make it clear enough. All right, if we assume 
that there are numerous things that exist, right? Well, let's assume plurality to start with. The numerous things that exist are finite in size, right? I'm finite in size, this pencil's finite in size, this desk is finite in size, and so on. Now, these things, like me, the desk, the pencil, are divisible, right? We can break them down into smaller parts, okay? Now, theoretically, each of these pieces, each of these things is divisible, not just once, but they're divisible over and over and over again. I can keep breaking them smaller, smaller, and smaller, 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 right? Even today, we know that we can divide the atom into smaller and smaller particles, okay? So he assumes we can divide these things ad infinitum or to infinity. Now, of course, if you now have the possibility of an infinite number of things, you're talking about something, uh, you know, a collection of things that would be infinite in size. An infinite number of parts means you have infinite size. Yet we started out by talking about things that are finite in size. So how can we have both finite size and infinite size at the same time? That's absurd. It's a contradiction. So the whole idea of there being a plurality is probably the wrong place to start. He says, no, things must be one and be indivisible, or we end up in this absurd conclusion of an infinite size um, universe. Okay, so that's kind of the rationale. That's how he reasons through this. But notice it's an argument. You know, it's a step-by-step -step process. And if you buy the premise, it's going to lead you to a ridiculous conclusion. So throw away your initial premise. That's the way it works. Let me give you one that's a little bit easier, maybe easier to follow. Actually, right there is a just a, a symbolic way of illustrating this. D stands for you know divisible. I stands for infinite. So if things are divisible, then they are infinite. If things are not infinite, obviously, therefore, they're not divisible. That's kind of how you would read the symbolic logic. Okay, but it's a, it's, a, it's a valid form of argument. That's what I was trying to show you. That actual um, argument form, which I just gave you, if you study logic, is called a modus tollens um, form of an argument. And that is a valid argument form. So you can't say his reasoning is incorrect. There's got to be something else going wrong if he is incorrect. And this puzzled the ancients, right? They had a difficult time trying to figure out where can you fix these paradoxes. Um, and not buy into the conclusion that there aren't multiple things. He has another argument, actually several, uh, a whole bunch of them, against change. And here we're going to use a type of change that we'll simply call motion. It's an argument against motion. Okay, and it's a story. It's a, basically a race between Achilles, who is the fastest of Greek heroes, and a tortoise, which is one of the slowest animals that you can come on. Now, the race is going to begin at the starting line. And Achilles is a hero, so he's a gentleman, and he's going to allow the tortoise, who he knows is slower, to get a head start. So the tortoise on the, you know, go starts racing down the track as slow as his short feet can carry him, and Achilles just stands there and watches as the tortoise gets so far down the track. And then he says, okay, I'm going to start now, and I'm going to catch up and pass the tortoise. That's the goal. Catch up and pass the tortoise. Now, the tortoise has gotten to point A, let's say. That's the first line at the first uh, level of this drawing. And Achilles now has to run as fast as he can to get to point A and catch up to the tortoise. But no matter how fast Achilles runs, some time will pass. And within that time, the tortoise will have moved on from point A to a further point down the track we'll call point B. Now, as soon as Achilles gets to point A, now he has to bridge the gap between point A and point B. But no matter how fast he goes, he, some time will pass and the tortoise will have moved on a little bit further, say to point C. Now he's got to move from point B to point C, but no matter how fast he goes, I think you get the pattern, some time will pass, the tortoise will have moved on even a little bit further. How long is this going to go on? Zeno says it will go on again for infinity. He will never catch the turtle, let alone pass him. It's impossible, okay? The reductio form of this argument be, if motion is possible, then things can move. That makes sense. If motion can happen, it can happen at different speeds. That seems to be true. And if an object's speed is greater, should be able to overtake the slower. Problem is, we've just seen an illustration, a story illustration, where it's not possible to overtake the slower. So motion would imply that the faster thing can overtake the slower and cannot overtake the slower at the same time, which is, again, a contradiction. Therefore, the whole idea of motion needs to be thrown out. Okay? 
there is no such thing as motion. And again, there are a lot of other arguments you could add to this. Now, where the problem is, it's probably an issue with mathematics. Again, going back to what we talked about with Pythagoras, when you conceptualize the world as a, you know, maybe a series of points on a line, points, remember, have no width, depth, dimension whatsoever. So you know, math- mathematically, yeah, you could divide a line infinitely into you know, smaller and smaller units, okay, and go on and on and on and on and never come to an end of that particular type of division. But can you actually do that in the real world? I guess if you're Pythagoras and think the entire world is just number, then that might be possible to divide something like that up infinitely, divide an object up infinitely. But numbers are abstract. They're not the same as physical things, right? We understand that today that, you know, numbers, um, you know, there's no such thing as a negative number in reality. So I think there's a confusion that lies behind the whole Zeno paradox um, perspective. But again, this is something that the ancients wrestled with. They couldn't really respond in a significant way to Zeno or prove that Parmenides is wrong. So what do you do? Well, what happens ultimately is the ancient philosophers that follow Heraclitus and Parmenides end up, um, I think the screen froze on, what happens is you end up with people not knowing who's right and who's wrong. You got Heraclitus on one side and he makes a good case. You got Parmenides on the other side, he makes a good case. And without a resolution, without knowing who's right and who's wrong, you end up in a period of kind of skepticism. You have the philosophers kind of in between these guys and Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, who we're going to approach very soon in the classical period. Um, The guys in between, who we're going to talk about later, kind of focus on other things. They're not going to focus on metaphysics. They're not going to focus on these big questions that seem, you know, too difficult to resolve. They're going to go off in more practical pursuits, ethics, politics, uh, rhetoric. So we'll look at that when we get down the road a little bit later. But right now, we've already introduced you to the, some of the big concepts. Like I said, they're going to be with us throughout the entire history of Western philosophy going forward. Materialism, formalism, form and matter, empiricism, rationalism, um, all of that stuff right from the beginning, the idealists and the materialists. And, and so, okay, that's the last lecture where we're going to focus on kind of the archaic period, the archaic thinkers, archaic religion. Where we're going to go from now, uh, from next, will be an investigation of the next period of Greek history, which is going to be the classical period. And we're going to start with a classical or an overview of the classical history.